Welcome back to the lab stage. Um, you're not going to want to miss this next session. I'm really excited for it. We've got some of the leading actors in data privacy and security to talk all things data sharing. Your host for this panel session is Professor Tim Watson. Tim is the new Programme Director for the Defence and Security Law at the Alan Turing Institute. He's seconded to the Institute from his role as Professor of Cybersecurity and the Director of the Cybersecurity Centre at the University of Warwick. He has more than 30 years experience working with government, industry and in academia and as an advisor to various parts of the UK government and to several professional and standards bodies. Over to you, Tim. Thanks so much. Um, so I think we'll start off by going around the, the room and the virtual room um, and we'll do a brief introduction. Um, so I think if we start virtually first, Rachel, do you want to just briefly introduce yourself? Oh, I'm Rachel Dugbarrel. I am the founder of a new tiny, tiny research company called Complexal, which is looking at using data and research to try and counter structural inequalities, but obviously because that involves a lot of issues around individual privacy as well. Thanks so much. Cynthia. Hi, I'm Cynthia Dwork. I'm a professor of computer science at Harvard. I'm also affiliated with the Harvard Law School and the Department of Statistics. Thanks. Zoe. Hi, uh, I'm Zoe Kurzi. I'm a professor of uh, cognitive and computational neuroscience at the University of Cambridge. Uh, and my work is at the interface of uh, AI and brain sciences. Uh, and I'm also an Alan Turing Fellow. Thanks so much. Okay, and in the room, Adam. Hi, I'm, my name's Adam Sias, and I'm GCHQ's Chief Data Scientist. And Fernando. I'm Fernando Lucini, I'm the Chief Data Scientist of Accenture. That's great. So um, we're here to talk about overcoming the challenges of data science, and I suppose we ought to start by exploring what the challenges are. So perhaps if I come to you first, Adam, um, I don't know if you've got an example to help, but, but what is it about sharing data that makes it so hard sometimes? Sure. Um, I think, you know, uh, there, are, there are several reasons that data sharing can be difficult. Um, in some cases, it's because policy or law prohibits it, regardless of whether that, there are any harms associated with that. Um, in some cases, that's because of um, concerns about um, competition, commercial competition. Um, in other cases, there's legitimate ethical concerns raised with combining data sets that could expose people's personal information or otherwise provide um, bad actors an opportunity to, to, to do some harms. Now, that's great. Thank you. Anybody else want to come in? I'm sort of looking uh, right. I, I, I get on a different, different, different angle, which is that uh, I think, all that notwithstanding, um, we've become amazing at storing stuff. We've become the world's you know, best at storing anything we can get our hands on for the last 30 years, but not peculiarly good at using it in any material way, never mind sharing it. So we've got a barrier to jump over. Right, so, so we're, we're the ultimate in hoarders, yeah, but unfortunately ultimate. everybody can visit our houses and go through any of our stuff. Well, we're the ultimate hoarders, but we don't open any doors and we haven't figured out a way to share any of our hoard. <laughs> right. Okay, o over to the virtual room. Um, challenges of sharing data. Are there any specific examples that you can think of that, that leap out as uh, being particularly challenging? Can I maybe say from a research perspective, uh, I think one of the difficulties is really um, we've, we've experienced a shift in the paradigm in which um, we do research uh, in, in the last few years. And that is uh, quite a lot, for example, in brain sciences, we're used in deep phenotyping uh, uh, studies that can only be done in, in small groups. Um, so this has been kind of our traditional experimental psychology, experimental medicine kind of way of working. Um, and, and now with population studies, I think uh, the technology has allowed us to actually do some of this more uh, deep phenotyping work in large population studies, but it almost feels like we haven't got a head around of how to work with this data, and part of it is sharing the data. So when, when we do the kind of smaller scale studies, we are used to really keeping this data for a long time, our teams are working on this data, but with large data, that's not something anymore that we can keep to ourselves, we really need to share because there is a lot of 
uh, uh, interesting ways to approach these larger data that we might not have the expertise locally. But this almost, requ this almost requires a, a kind of paradigm shift in our thinking of how we deal with Sometimes that makes it harder uh, for researchers to be able to share. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, Cynthia, anything to add? Certainly. So in addition to questions of sharing the actual data, there are questions that arise when you simply release statistics about the data that you've collected. And there's um, what we call the fundamental law of information reconstruction, which says essentially that overly accurate estimates of too many statistics completely compromises privacy and allows the actual data to be reconstructed. And that's a mathematical law that has nothing to do with any attempts that anybody might have to control it. Overly accurate estimates of too many statistics is dangerous. So you asked about whether there's a specific example that highlights this. So in the US, the Census Bureau has uh, deployed a uh, technique called differential privacy for handling the uh, disclosure avoidance in the 2020 decennial census. The Census Bureau publishes literally billions of statistics on the data of about 308, 309 million people. So we're well into this area of concern of too many statistics about too small a set of uh, individuals. It's a huge challenge. Yeah, uh, and, and I guess that suggests that there's a corollary to your fundamental law of data sharing, which is that in order to be able to share it uh, completely safely, you need to make it fairly useless. And that there's a, there's a balance where you need to get the, um, the reward of uh, what you get from sharing it balanced by the risk, particularly to vulnerable individuals. I might change that a little bit. So you should perhaps it's it's better not to think in terms of completely sharing and completely not sharing, but limiting the uses. And if you limit the uses, you might find yourself in a situation where you don't have to respond to too many statistical queries. And then you can answer with relatively small distortions and, and be quite safe. So it's not necessarily all or nothing. It's how to be, uh, how to husband our resources well. Right. So, so this this brings us on to uh, the concept of a privacy budget, and the idea that that people are allowed to ask a certain amount of things, but but they can't ask for too much because that then um, risks invading people's privacy. Um, and I I wonder whether there is a there is an issue that that even when we work to limit the uses that um, the data is going to be put, that there are still risks that people don't understand. Um, and one of the challenges is making sure that people are confident enough in allowing their data to be shared. Indeed, and you've touched on a very important point because people always tend to frame this as a uh, utility versus privacy trade-off with the implicit belief that if we had no privacy, we would have wonderful utility. But there's, there's the future. If we have no privacy this time and lots of utility in the immediate future, in the long term, people will stop answering questions because their privacy has been compromised and their confidence has been shaken. And so, that's that time dimension is often missing from the discussion. Yeah, yeah. so it's a longitudinal relationship and we need to protect that as well. Um, right. No, thanks so much for that. Rachel, um, so coming back to the original opening question about the challenges of data sharing, are there any areas that, that have struck you as being particularly challenging? I think one of the things that no one's really touched on yet is the challenges of not sharing it. And it's not quite what Cynthia was saying in terms of that utility balance, but in the sense of if you're dealing with human participants. And so, for example, one of the things that I do in my spare time is I'm a trustee for a women's refuge and domestic violence charity. And when we want to ask people about their experiences, it can be quite traumatizing. It can be 
an extremely upsetting thing to discuss. And if you say to researchers, oh, you can't share this data, it must live in this silo, it must never be shared, you're creating a different kind of harm, which is that different sets of researchers are going to go out and ask these same people the same question. And I feel like that's something that often doesn't get talked about as much because people are very focused on the data. But those humans that are actually providing that data, it's not always a neutral process. It's not always just sitting and filling out, you know, factual information about your life. It's you know, all sort of like figures and facts. It can be very personal. No, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, we've got a question in um, from Mark Ritchie saying, are there feelings on the lack of a standard for removing data after it's been shared? And importantly, for that removal to populate through the sharing channels. So I guess this is the, you tell one company one thing um, because you were feeling particularly gen generous with your uh, uh, private data on one day and all of a sudden you discover that it's, it's out and you're getting targeted adverts for all sorts of things. You'd quite like to run the clock back. You can't, but it would be really nice to be able to um, remove that data, um, ask for it to be removed and for that to cascade through. I mean, is that just a pipe dream nowadays, uh, Adam? Um, I mean, there is no reason why that couldn't be encoded in law and policy. And in fact, in, in our business, it is encoded in law and policy. And we have very strict um, time to live on data sets. And there are exceptions that can be made in extreme need. But in general, um, a piece of data that's collected does not remain with us forever. Yeah. Um, once that meets the real world, that gets complicated, right? Like, you don't know where your data goes after it leaves your, your phone or whatever. Um, but I would certainly endorse not having that data live forever. <laughs> no, good point. Mm. Fernando. I think the troubling part of this, if you live in the commercial world, is the, the ownership of data, right? Is the, it's probably the question of our time. Ownership of data for us as individuals, with companies, for the governments, and for others, right? Mechanically within companies, this is extraordinarily difficult. What we just described is within the realms of extraordinary. And we go, why? Uh, back to the, we become the hoarders. We come from a, a, a an, we've inherited a bunch of ways of working where we put all this data in a certain place where we had uses like this, like this didn't even exist in our wildest imagination. So I think we, we, we do have to go back to government, and government has to push it down, and, and super smart people like uh, Cynthia and others that are, that are here today that we all admire will have to help us with what is, the, what is the reality statistically of doing this in a proper way. But companies are sitting on effectively a massive debt, an enormous technical debt that they call right? So the amount of money you have to throw at this to re reset this thing up in a way that this will be true. So my view is that we're very far away, but uh, society as a whole is ready for it. That's the, I think that's the contradiction, right? So we've got the, these yeah. enormous, enormous technical issues to get there. But all of us as, as individuals sitting there and thinking, well, the ownership of data is the question of our time, of my time. So what's the answer to that question? Right? Create a yeah. data jubilee where we delete all of the data once, you know, <laughs> January 1st, 2023. And then after that, every data has a, ha, only lives for one year. Or it expires itself, right? This concept yeah, it, of data yeah. that expires itself that we used to have, in, and it's been implemented by a few of the, of, the, of the internet platforms, right? But what happens to a bank or a telco that actually owns some yeah. data for you, that actually thinks they're going to help you? What's the value of information in time, the molecule of data? What is the value to you and to them? All of these are super complex questions. Yeah, yeah. Never mind the mechanical issues of how to deal with it. So I think that's the problem. The problem we've got is, how are we going to deal with the technological issue that you know, companies have today versus us as a society really wanting to know what's going on with the data and how does it represent me? So I like the data jubilee. Yeah, I want, to, I want to clarify that that is not a real thing. I just made it up. I, um, yes, yeah. And I also want to clarify <laughs> that, I mean, this is actually an important point. There's, there's data that is out there because it was collected from you, you know, cookies on your phone or whatever. Yeah. Um, and that, that set of data is different from my bank account, right? Like, like there's data that I own and that is sort of acknowledged that I own it because the bank knows where my bank accounts are that I want to persist forever. And there's no real, like, there's no real harms there to be worried about. I'm really focused on the more um, ambiguous, you know, all of the online purchases I've made over the last 10 years or whatever. Right. So, yes. So it reminded me, so I've got... Uh, uh, 
twin boy and girl and they were 21 on Monday. And I wonder whether it would be a very good idea to offer all 21-year-olds the ability to have all of their data. What? So Hard reset. You've grown up, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're about to be applying for jobs. Let's, let's do it. I mean, it's a serious issue. Um, uh, Rachel, um, so, so for people um, growing up or um, having major life changes, is there a sense in which we ought to allow a reset? And, and uh, are there any ways in which that might become practical? I mean, I could definitely see the advantages. Um, I really like approaches where you take the analytics to the data. So instead of passing data out to anyone who wants to work on it, um, I think we did a really good example with COVID data and NHS data and enabling researchers to come and build on a central platform, but they didn't have your individual medical records. They had access to a platform on which they could run analytics over them. I'm struggling to think of commercial incentives to bring that to people like Facebook to get anyone and sort of big tech to be interested in engaging with that kind of model. But from a sort of research and government perspective, that feels like a potential with more sort of, it feels easier than having every single piece of your data have provenance on it and somebody has to trust that they're going to run analytics on a thousand different systems to delete that piece of data. Because if it's only in one place, like with the bank account example, you trust your bank to kind of keep an accurate record of your transactions, keep an accurate record of your balance and to keep those up to date. So if somebody wants to do financial research, it would make far more sense for that to be done on bank computers than to hive all that off into a university, for instance. And, and that's amazing because you have predicted the next question uh, that came in from Mark Diamond, who said, any thoughts on the challenges due to the size of the data set? Any insights into taking the problem to the data? So data proximate compute versus sharing copies. Um, I, I mean, I guess this is something that we've all worked with. Cynthia, I think you were about to say. I would just point out that this is exactly the case where you have to worry about how many things you release about the data. You take the analytics to the data and do some computation, you release a result. That's basically a statistic about the data. And so all of the issues about overly accurate uh, estimates of too many statistics being problematic arise. Taking the question to the data, the analytics to the data does not solve the problem. It does not solve all problems. It solves some problems. Yeah. And, and yes. Zoe, I mean, the work that you're doing on the brain, presumably this is, this is massive amounts of data that you're collecting. And, and um, the, the thought of having to uh, share copies and then email them around people um, uh, would be uh, completely impractical. So I guess for you, uh, you, are, you are constrained in what you do to make sure that the analytics moves towards the data rather than the other way around. Yeah, so it, yes, it is a big problem. As, as soon as you touch any brain data, it simply expands and it gets even bigger and bigger. Um, so uh, the, the other important things when you work with brain data is especially when, when you're trying to uh, be able to, to build models for predicting health based on brain data, it's really important to be able to integrate the brain data with other parameters. For example, uh, you might need some demographics, you might need some epidemiological data, electronic health records. So all, all of this data to be integrated, uh, uh, it's, it's really, it becomes massive. Um, and the, the, the next problem we have is that we don't want to build health models that they are for a single population or for a single, sing, single country, because uh, uh, brain disorders are global problems. They, they're not just problems in the UK. So we need to be able to build tools and algorithms that actually generalize across populations. Now, we couldn't really bring all the data uh, from all continent, continents to the UK. We need to be able to bring tools that actually we go to, will go to the data. Uh, and so, you know, we can, we can solve many problems. If, for example, we can build platforms that allow us to do federated uh, learning, uh, bring data from uh, different samples, different populations, and also very different types of data. Some of that data, uh, like electronic health records, is really very hard to come out of different healthcare systems. But if we can bring the tools to the data, then we solve these problems. But of course, as Cynthia says, not all problems. Uh, but some problems uh, can be solved and, and really in the, in the space of health uh, and brain sciences, um, it's, it's really critical to be able to, to build tools um, that can be shared that way. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, I am conscious that we're, we've got some lovely questions coming out. Uh, we're all 
um, violently agreeing with each other, and there's nothing better than a bit of dispute. So, so I'm going to pick on a question uh, that I, I, I know uh, you're not all going to say the same answer, um, um, if for no other reason than Adam's decided that we're going to have an argument at some what? point within the middle of this hour. So um, I'm going to pick on a question here from um, Kath Carly Mukherjee. Um, which is safer to store, segmented data in separate blocks or centralised data as one database? So is it safer to store it in one database or to keep it separate? So, OK, I'm going to ask Cynthia first. I need to wrap my head around the problem a little bit more because I'm not quite sure what you're trying to do with the data. If it's simply a question of storage, sure, segment it, break up the threat. If it's a question of trying to be able to uh, carry out analytics on, on the union of the segments, then there are reasons for trying to uh, have things centralized. Um, uh, so I'm not quite sure what's being asked. Which of these? That's, that's excellent, Cynthia. You're disagreeing with yourself. <laughs> I think that's that's perfect, Adam. So I think that we're we're talking around a thing, which is what does it mean for data to be unsafe, right? And in order to wrestle with that, you have to understand what threat you're trying to protect against. And with all data science problems. There, I'm, I'm not minimizing, like there are, there are threats associated with this data getting out um, or, or the wrong people having access to it and being able to exploit it. Um, those threats need to be balanced against the, the potential opportunity, right? Um, with medical science, right, the, you have sort of almost by, by definition vulnerable people's data um, being available. This could absolutely be exploited for harm, but we still collect vulnerable people's data because we want to make them less vulnerable. I want to secure what's, what's wrong with them. So I don't, I don't think that question is really answerable in the abstract. I think um, for any given data set and any given problem, there is some opportunity to do something hopefully good with the data and some risk of exploitation. And you need to balance, balance those factors. And sometimes that means protecting a data set maybe by breaking it up. Sometimes it means bringing it together because by bringing it together, you can do better inference. Um, but, you know. And I guess the other issue would be there might be an argument for saying if you bring it together um, in a place that is specifically designed to look after data with people who have lots of experience because they are looking after lots of data, that might be that might be more secure than lots of little segmented databases. That they've not been pulled together, so there's less of a risk there, but each one individually might be bitten off quite easily by adversaries. Mm -hmm. Fernando. Mm -hmm. I'm struggling with this one because the truth is you can but, secure both. You can, to Cynthia's point, the utility is important. Uh, you know, who owns it? How do they want to use it? I, I don't, it depends on the size. Depends the size. Now, how easy it is to get a database, put it in a box, and only only you can access it. Fantastic. Now it's secure, right? How easy it is to distribute the data all over the place, like uh, the big vendors do, the big internet vendors, and put it all over the place where no human being can possibly put it together, right? And Cynthia will tell us that the statistics of that is probably quite a fun challenge, right? I, go, I, I like the way you've posed the problem. It's more of You're the... You're supposed to disagree with me. I'll, I'll disagree in a second. But... It'd be nice to go back to this nice, nice, nice person and ask, okay, what was the core of the question? Is the core of the question really a, how do we use technology to secure? Or is the question yeah. more, is distributed data more inherently safe than, yeah. than centralized data? And should we even have our own data in our own home? And not owned by the telco, not yeah. owned by the bank. It's sitting in within a bunch of machines or, or, or something that's sitting in the comfort of my own home, or I said, not, not home as in physical home, as in you know, internet home. It's an interesting topic to touch, but I'm not quite sure, again, like Cynthia, where the core of the problem he sees yeah. are. And I, I think we can... The natural response is to say, don't pull stuff together unless you know how to secure it, because you're creating a one-stop shop for somebody who might be able to make malicious use of it. And we're probably implicitly assuming that the information is likely to be to do with people, and they would prefer it not getting out or being aggregated. I mean, I... I, yes, but I want to abstract that a little bit. I think it's don't pull the information together unless the benefit is worth the risk. Yeah. 
Yeah, perfect. Okay, right. I've got another one here. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but I'm going to ask it anyway because that's good. Um, how and where to examine the impact of data sensibility in artificial intelligence to meet the global high-tech standards? Now, I guess one way in which I might uh, interpret the question, data sensibility is, perhaps this is about context. So um, I don't want to share my medical records with strangers in the street. But if I fall over and I'm having a heart attack, I probably want my phone to do precisely that. So there is a context dependence about, and so um, data isn't just this thing, and you can make one decision and it'll be the right decision. There are some sensibilities, some sensitivities, some context around it. So how do we get more intelligent sharing, I guess, that's context dependent? Um, let's ask Rachel. Oh dear, I must have looked like I was thinking deep thoughts. Um, I think, there's something about, um, I think there are two different things, right? There's, there's explicit and well understood consent for data sharing, and that's one thing. And then there's your example of falling down having a heart attack, at which point you sort of want, you're not in a position to give that consent, you're not in a position to not deny it either, you're not, you, you sort of need to take yourself out of that loop. And um, when I hear things like that, my mind goes to, um, examples about things like, say, confidentiality in a counselling context. You sit down with your therapist, they say, there is a small number of set times when I will be obliged to break the confidentiality of this room. These are, for example, if there is a danger to yourself or others. And those things, they've not been designed for AI, they've not been designed for data sharing, but they have been designed by careful humans as circumstances in which it's normally okay for information to get shared more widely than you might have thought you were agreeing to. Now, it's sometimes quite interesting actually in terms of recent news because one of the other examples is to do with potentially to do with criminal offences and um, providing information to the authorities. And that makes me think of the recent sort of massive outcry over Apple wanting to scan iCloud images for um, indecent images of children. So. It's not clear to me that there's huge social agreement even on that as a baseline, but I think it gives us a place to start that isn't starting inside our own head. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, the other thing that I'm conscious of is we're, we're often very good, and particularly the questions often lead us to admire the problem. And there are all sorts of tools and techniques, um, some highly technical, which we now have that were recently developed that can actually help in terms of data sharing. Things like federated an analytics and differential privacy, um, homomorphic encryption, things like that. So, so at some stage, it would be good to give people a flavor of what these are. Um, however, I have the ideal thing for us, which is a controversial question from Hannah Clark, who asks, why are we worried about data sharing? Apart from finance and legal, surely we would benefit more from having a more transparent society. So uh, we're all worth worrying about nothing. Um, Zoe, what are your Yes, it would be nice to say that this is all kind of an unnecessary worry, wouldn't it? Um, but uh, yeah, I think um, it, that our worries in terms of you know, legalities here really infiltrate all of the areas. Uh, like, for example, um, health, um, you, you can't really separate these. Um, and, and I think that that's really the tricky thing, isn't it? Yeah, certainly. Um, there is a sense, however, that, that in the past we had far less privacy. I mean, certainly um, in England uh, centuries ago, people used to live in great big shared accommodation because there were wolves and brigands outside. And you lived in extended families because there was added security there, but you had very little privacy. Everybody knew everybody else's business. So there is a sense perhaps where it might be seen that it's a, a first world problem, this, this worrying about privacy. Cynthia, do you have any thoughts? Yes, I have something to say about that. So this has come up a lot in the context of, uh, of the US Census. 
And the kinds of things, the kinds of weaponization that could happen are, say, the creation of lists of all of the, say, same-sex uh, married, married families in, in the country. And so the response of, oh, well, it isn't really a problem because my neighbors already know that I'm gay, misses the point that with this kind of national weaponization, people in neighborhoods that you don't feel safe living in also know that you're gay. And, and uh, you can also end up, say, creating kind of the pedophile's friends, lists of all children of a certain sex and a certain ethnicity and a certain age range. Um, you can figure out who is in violation of um, so-called Section 8 housing. This is federally subsidized housing, having too many people living in the house in violation of the agreement. And people wait years to get these homes and they could end up being evicted as a result. So there are lots of harms that can happen. And the, the it's, it's, it, it, they can come from the people who aren't the ones that you chose to live with. Yeah, so, so it comes back to that risk and reward thing, which, and I do take the point, Cynthia, that you said often people try and treat it as a zero-sum game, and it's, it's, the, it's the utility versus the, the risks of sharing, and it's more complex than that, and it isn't zero-sum, um, but, but nevertheless, um, it perhaps wouldn't be a wondrous world were we to live in one that was as transparent, given modern technology and the fact that people can um, uh, uh, aggregate data. I'm certainly not going to take a maximalist position on data sharing, both because of where I work and also the, the extremely valid points raised. But I think I, 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 the, the question asker, there's a nugget there that I want to tease out, um, which isn't like all of our like web browsing history for all of time should be publicly available. That's obviously nonsense. But within communities, I do think more transparency could be better, right? Like the medical research community, right, probably should have more ability to share data with each other, right? Like there are obvious benefits to global public health if we did that. That doesn't mean that all medical history available should be available to, made available to like our employers or our neighbors, but there, there are these, these fenced off spaces um, where more transparency does actually produce a concrete benefit and we should, we, should, we should have strong barriers between those communities and the rest of the world, but within those communities, break down the barriers wherever we can. Mm. It's still a bit, for me, this is the scarier scenario, right? One where we actually have total transparency of data. I'm got an autistic 15-year-old, and I don't particularly need anybody else to know that he's autistic. He can live his life and make his decisions. Right. Um, I mean, in my line of work, where it's thousands of companies, tens of thousands of use cases, I'm horrified by any of this sharing beyond what I would like to be shared. So it, it, it's a bit of a dangerous one. Um, Look, my, my, my father was left-handed, and in Spain in the 1940s, they tied his hand behind his back so he would learn to ride with his right, because that was not on. So we as humans have a capacity to create absolute monsters. Uh, and, and Cynthia's given us a bunch of examples, and I'm sure she can, she's got hundreds of them. So our capacity to, to create monstrosities is, is, uh, is, you know, has no limits, uh, and data is at the core of everything that represents us, or is it? Or is it just an image of what represents us? And it might be true, it might not be true, it's interpretable. It's a, that's why this, go well, back to the data ownership is the question of our time, because this is really complex and difficult. But transparency, I, I hear you. And use the example of COVID. Will we have been better off if information was shared more broadly and institutions didn't have to fight for it? I think so. I'm not 100% sure everybody agrees. I'm sure there's plenty of people who don't agree that the vaccines were great for, you know, for humanity and would fight us on this. But, so I think this is such a polarizing issue. But for me, total transparency, oh my God. You know, I'm a science fiction fan. I think you can have a thought experiment how this can go very wrong in about 10 seconds, right? Yeah, yeah. No, thank you all um, for that. I agree. Um, yeah. Right, Daniel Collins asks, do you see the use of differentially private synthetic data gaining traction across all fields and domains? What are the key challenges that need to be addressed? So I guess we ought to start by uh, somebody volunteering to tell us what differentially private synthetic data is. Then we might have to break that into pieces. I'll have a go at the synthetic, because okay. it's my, I, I love this, I'm sure others will start, but for, and the answer for me is yes, to some degree. synthetic data for me is, is critical. What is it? It is the creation of data, machine created, hopefully with AI, 
from the signature of the data that exists such that we hold all of the, all of the signals, all of the patterns, but none of the originality of the data, and thus there's hope of privacy within. I'm not saying we're not saying it's 100%, there's also ways. Um, but being, and there's simple examples all over the place of, even ba banks are a great example, who can't use their own data for their own purposes within their walls because it's so protected that they can't even use it without even impacting anybody outside because it's so protected. So there's simple use cases where you could really easily, the COVID example, another one, where you could take the data with all the, all the information about us, create a synthetic version of that based on all the patterns that are within that somebody else can use without ever, you know, if we're not, let's not say ever, ever, but with the hope that that information can be, can be, can be used safely. I think that's a wonderful concept. Right. And, and differential... Can I comment about this? Yeah, please. Yeah. Thanks, Cynthia. So I agree that this is in fact the definition or a view of synthetic data. But the idea that these data would sort of capture all of the statistics, um, these synthetic data would capture all of the statistics of the data set from which they were drawn is precisely an example of trying to build something that will reveal very accurate estimates of very large numbers of statistics. And that's why the question involves the, in the, the phrase differential privacy, because you need to create these synthetic data in a way that nonetheless preserves the privacy of the individuals in the real data set. By virtue of being synthetic, they don't necessarily provide that protection. That has to be done intentionally with sort of formal mathematical uh, uh, methods. And uh, as to whether I think that uh, differentially private synthetic data are going to be used in many contexts, I can say, I hope so. We know that there are certain complexity theoretic challenges to doing this for at least contrived sorts of questions and even some less contrived questions that sort of the math forces either a lot of uh, samples or a lot of computation, but um, science makes progress and I can really just keep my fingers crossed. There's a bunch of fun things that we have to consider, right? If there's gonna be all these things, all this synthetic data being shared, who made it, how did they make it? Uh, can you demonstrate to us that it is differentially private? Can you demonstrate it? Can you also demonstrate that it was created fairly from the original? An Im immense amount of questions. And then the horror scenario, which is imagine five years from now where you can buy a synthetic data set and uh, heavens knows how that's been made or where it's been made or uh, it creates an entire new fun scenario. So. I'm going I'm to take the under on this one. I think so. So one of the one of the tenants at a coarsely and high level of differential privacy is you you manipulate the data so that the true data is no longer there. It has been changed. Um, I, how do you know you haven't manipulated the signal that you were trying to extract from it? In which case, you're, you, you, you've ruined yourself. Um, and with synthetic data, the life is messy and the real world is complicated. And simulations are incredibly valuable, but that to, I think it is, it is hubris to think we could create a simulated data set that maintains enough of the real world's ambiguities to be truly useful in a real world context. So I am I'm pessimistic about those as ways forward. Okay. With or without privacy. You're saying even if you ignore the question of privacy, your yes. statements make sense, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can only in some sense ensure the things that you have set about to ensure. This, yeah. And we, we haven't discussed it, but of course, the method of how you do it is important as well. So and to everybody's point, these are complicated things to do. You create this you know, synthetic data set with a, with a, I don't know, a variation on to encoder or something like that. These are complicated things that require, you know, deep thinking about how they are created. And mm -hmm. Do they have those signals? Can you confirm those signals? In confirming those signals, do you confirm, do you remove the privacy? Oh, God, the whole thing is an enormous, enormous and very interesting field, but certainly evolving very quickly. And, and that, so it brings us on to another question from Anna Maria, um, who asks, what's your opinion on ownership of information derived from data, such as machine learning model weights? So we're talking about synthetic data. We're talking about um, using training data that then trains a model. In a sense, that model knows about you. And so, so there's been a transference of that information in some sense. So what do we feel about ownership? Should we say that 
uh, that there is a sense in which you could ask for your data to be removed from a previously trained AI model? Would that be possible? I mean, technological difficulties aside, yeah, I think I should own every movie I've watched on, not the movie themselves, but like my viewing history of Netflix. Like that, that feels like it's my own personal or, you know, me and my family's personal stuff. But I mean, how do you get Netflix to agree to that? Yeah, yeah. Your yeah. influence on the model, right? So you, you, yeah. you're choosing to own the right to the influence you have on and it's another set of answers, another set of patterns, another set of whatever. Is that mm -hmm. It's complicated, but it's interesting. Yeah. I'd agree. Yes, I'd, I'd want to know what I'm influencing and why. Okay, so before I come to Fernando for uh, uh, presumably the commercial view, <laughs> Sam Young is asking a question. What about, because we've talked a lot about personal data. So what about non-personal data? Because seeing it as a commercial asset encourage hoarding, even if it's not being used, so how can we overcome that for societal benefit? Um, so perhaps Rachel. Oh, wow, I feel like I'm the worst person to answer this because I have very little commercial experience. Um, uh, so, okay. So probably, like, part of the answer has to be around incentivization, right? It has to be people are getting something out of it as well as just feeling good about themselves. Or that companies have to feel that they are getting some kind of benefit. Um, from sharing this information beyond just, oh, I feel like I am contributing to the good of the world by creating open data. It probably needs to have some sort of commercial incentive because a lot of organizations are driven by their own ruling documents to prioritize shareholder value. Um, I think there's a really interesting discussion here to have about things like B Corp, where there are other requirements other than just pure profit, which are actually taken into account in the setting how a company is doing and maybe there's scope for engaging with organizations like that to have conversations around could we build something about data into those sorts of assessments of sort of yeah, social so good. There are public good arguments and externalities and things and in particular if we're talking um, about um, non-public data so we might have weather satellites and they're collecting detailed information on temperatures around the world uh, not within buildings, because all, all of a sudden that starts impinging on privacy. But nevertheless, you could imagine that uh, a business might hoard that and uh, maximise its profits for one aspect of that data. But that data might provide far more societal benefits were it to be released. So, I mean, how do we go about that as a society? Is that a sort of regulatory thing? How would you even know if that data had been collected? Yeah. Uh, and, that, and that's, uh, I would say that so companies are highly motivated to, to try and share data today. Whether they're hoarding data that, say, that has nothing to do with us, which rarely does not have to do with us in some degree, right? Uh, or whether it does directly have to do with us. And think about examples around you, right? If you're, if you're a bank and you're trying to figure out financial crime, you are normally, you're now doing it within yourself and you may work with the police and the regulator in some way. It's very documented, very careful. You probably have no issue if the regulator lets you to talk to the other 20 banks and figure out how to use that, uh, that AI to, and all that clever stuff to figure out financial crime around it. And I'm sure the police would raise their hand and say, fabulous, I'll tell you what I think, you tell me what you think, and together we, we, we catch bad people. So I think this, that's just one scenario. Uh, people that try to sell you stuff, they, now banks have to figure out where you've been. You were around Marks and Spencers, would you like to have a donut? They'd love to know that so they can give you better service. So the motivation is enormously high out there. I, I will, I mean, I, I, I don't want to be you know, negative, but at the same time, they have all of these really difficult, go back to the beginning, all these difficult technological barriers from within, never mind governmental and regulatory, that make it really difficult to do this in a way that's sensible. So, but are they motivated commercially? They've never been more motivated. Just, just use examples around you, everywhere you go. You're bombarded by services from primary providers that want to give you secondary services, from your phone to your computer to your bank to your, you know, to the, the sweet shop in the corner that uh, you walk in and already is trying to sell you something on your phone. Right? Yeah, it's um, Mark Ritchie asks a question which I think carries on from that, which is about legal responsibilities. What legal responsibilities exist for sharing data? Can a company be held to account for what another then does with it, e.g. Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. So, I mean, there are, there are GDPR in the European Union, so we've got 
we've got restrictions on collecting data. And there was another question, I, I, I can't spot it for a minute, about should we restrict, yes, uh, Henry Seeley, um, uh, is the question not about should we restrict the gathering of data going forward rather than what we should do with the information already collected? So, so we are seeing regulation about that that's trying to restrict it. But this comes back to that public benefit that actually sharing data, collecting more data, can provide societal benefit. But there are risks inherent in that. Right. I mean, if you're a company today, and you've got hopefully a good legal counsel, uh, you will be you will be told. And I'm sure Cynthia has immense experience with this specifically. You'll be told very clearly that you have to hold data, and there has to be a reason for you to hold data. You cannot just decide to hold data for no, absolutely no reason, commercial or otherwise. So we don't hoard data just for you know like we used to. Do, just 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 hold it and see what happens. Yeah. You ask yourself very carefully. I'm holding this data. Why am I holding this data? Both legally and mechanically. Mechanically, it might cost a lot of money, so why would you store it? Legally, is there a good reason why we got this? Do we have a commercial idea in the future? Are we collecting it for the, you know, for the, for the, for the police or for, the, or for other bodies that might require it? So I think that, that's sort of answered. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I'll let others speak. And, and that actually sounds good. good. So, Cynthia. <laughs> Sorry, I feel speechless and I feel ignorant. Remember, I'm in the United States. I. I get the sense that there isn't a whole lot of explaining as to why we're holding data. We're holding data because we we want to use it to improve our services for you. And that seems to cover everything. So, um, I mean, you might or might not believe that, but that's a stated reason. So I think, I think maybe the, the critical thing here is that laws are generally written slowly and regulatory powers evolve over time. I think we, as a, a, and conversely, research and the technology industry moves very quickly. And so we don't have a tempo to sort of build up a regulatory framework and see how it works, right? Because the, by the time you've built up the regulatory framework, the technology has moved past what you were trying to regulate. Um, I don't have a good answer for that, right? Like, uh, you know, elect more statisticians, like, I guess. Um, I, could, I, could, I could behind that, yeah, I could get behind that. Um, but I think, I think, I think we, need to, we need to figure out what laws would help. I don't think we even know that yet. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah can I I think think also, oh, please, go ahead, Zoe. Oh, I was just going to say that I, I think I, I don't see much of a problem really with collecting data as long as uh, it has been checked in advance that the use of the data is ethical. And, and at least in the research domain uh, that expands also not, not only uh, within um, uh, academic environments, but also uh, industry. I think in, in that domain, uh, we do have quite more strict ethical procedures uh, to follow. So when uh, we have approval for data collection, it usually includes also uh, the use of the data. And, and that's where GDPR has come in uh, to make that more concrete and more clear um, and, and kind of um, uh, clarify these gray areas where we had seen in the past um, difficulties with coping. But I, I think the, for me, the space we really need to work on more is trust. And, and you know, the example that was brought earlier in the question of, we used to have no privacy, we used to live with, uh, you know, uh, extended um, families and it's because uh, the relationships of trust were very different. And that's, I think, where we are now going with AI. We, we've got a big strive to build tools that they are trustworthy. And, and this is a huge field. And, and so if we can achieve this, I think we could resolve um, quite a few of the problems of the data at the data collection end. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, so we're getting to the last five minutes um, of this session. Um, I'm going to uh, be really mean and come round you all shortly, asking you whether or not you accept all cookies when you do web browsing. But first of all, I've got a specific question for, jo for Zoe from Cheryl. Um, and uh, Cheryl says, would Zoe be able to give some insight into data sharing for phenotyping, especially linking across multiple routinely collected clinical data sets? Okay, yeah, so um, some examples of, of how this is done, or? Uh, I guess so. It's, uh, it's, it, what we're looking for is insight into data sharing for phenotyping. So, so uh, 
yeah, why it's done, how it's done, um, yeah, those sorts of things. Yeah, so I think this is something that we have seen uh, recently and it's something that we are really trying to achieve securely. And it's it's taking uh, different types of, of data and linking it with clinical data. Uh, so uh, research data to be uh, linked, for example, with electronic health records. This has massive uh, potential uh, for um, resolving uh, issues that relate to healthcare for making healthcare pathways more efficient. Now, how this is done is, is actually really, really difficult. And I think the approach we are working with uh, come closer to what we discussed earlier in terms of bringing tools to the data rather than taking the data, uh, the very kind of sensitive clinical data out of their environments. Um, so that, that's, that's a space really that um, we are juggling now. Okay, no, that's really helpful. Um, so we're getting towards the end. There are so many good questions. Apologies to all people who've uh, taken the time to send in questions that we're not going to get to. I'm going to do some rapid fire, so so we'll have uh, really quick answers. So uh, let's do the uh, uh, accept all cookies. So Adam, do you accept all cook cookies? I do not. You do not. Do Why? Not. Uh, because that's my data, and I don't want you to have it. Okay, excellent. Fernando? If, if I perceive the source to be trustworthy, I do. With all the flaws of my radar for trustworthiness. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. Um, Rachel? I turn cookies off in my browser because I don't believe the banners, and the, uh, research has shown the banners don't always actually do what you ask them to do. And there are so many buttons and it does take you like half your entire life to turn them all down manually. So I just turn my browser off from accepting cookies at all. Okay, excellent. Uh, Cynthia? I, you... did, um, I decline as well. Okay, and Zoe? Uh, it depends who asks. If it's the NHS, when I try to book my COVID vaccine, then I say yes. Um, but uh, for other more kind of commercial interests, I say no. Okay. Uh, another quick one. Um, Anonymous has asked a question. Should data be nationalised for the public good? Fernando? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Okay. Anyone want to say yes? That's a really good idea. There is a sense in which some data perhaps ought to be. Um, if it's been funded by um, public funds for doing research. So we have, we have things where uh, there is a sense, certainly in this you country. Take, you where, take the question, though. Yeah. It's more of an absolute. I've changed the question to the question that I would like to answer, and then I've done that. Uh, that's good. Okay. Um, right. Somebody else raised a question about synthetic data. Uh, we've only got a minute left. Uh, what do we feel on the use of synthetic data? Is it fine? Is it fine to use synthetic data? If it's useful. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. If it's useful and safe, yeah. Brilliant. All right. Um, any closing thoughts? What haven't we covered that we ought to cover? So, Rachel, what should I have asked you? Um, well, we haven't touched on linguistic data at all, and I feel like we've talked about a lot of techniques that work on maths and pure numbers and if you don't have a way of reliably extracting the features you want from that data then a lot of those algorithms just won't get you anywhere right now right so so uh yeah so there's a whole area around linguistic analysis that we could cover uh -huh. cynthia so I'd, I'd, I'd like to raise the question of who is advocating for privacy when push comes to shove everybody wants to use the data and there is nobody organizationally that is really opposing this so privacy can lose big time uh, as a result yeah. no thank you all very much okay i think we've reached the end um it's been a delightful conversation thank you all so much for taking the time to uh, uh share your insights with us um i think we're just wrapping up now and um before the next session there's a short break but there's a video that we're going to play within it thank you all very much